did the human brain evolve to think? That's essentially th the question that you address in the essay. Can you speak to it? Sure. You know, the, the big caveat here is that we don't really know why brains evolved. The, the big why questions are called teleological questions. And um, in general, scientists should avoid those questions because we don't know really why. We don't know the why. However, for, for a very long time, the assumption was that evolution worked in a progressive upward scale that you start off with simple organisms and those organisms get more complex and more complex and more complex. Now, obviously that's true in some like really general way, right? That, that um, life started off as single cell organisms and you know things got more complex. But the idea that, um, that brains evolved in some upward um, trajectory from simple brains in simple animals to complex brains in complex animals is called a phylogenetic scale. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that phylogenetic scale is embedded in a lot of evolutionary thinking, including Darwin's, actually. Um, and it's been seriously challenged, I would say, by modern uh, evolutionary biology. Um, and so, you know, thinking is something that rationality is something that humans, at least in the West, really prize um, as a great uh, human achievement. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that the most common evolutionary story is that, you know, brains evolved in um, like sedimentary rock um, uh, with, you know, an, a layer for instincts, that's your lizard brain, and a layer on top of that uh, uh, for emotions, that's your limbic system, limbic meaning border. So it borders the parts that are for instincts. Oh, interesting. And um, and then um, the uh, neocortex or new cortex where um, rationality is supposed to live. That's the sort of traditional story. It just keeps getting layered on top right. or by evolution. Right. And, and so you can think about, you know, I mean, sedimentary rock is the way typically people describe it. The way I, I sometimes like to think about it is, um, you know, thinking about the cerebral cortex like... Uh, icing on an already baked cake, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, at where, you know, the cake is your inner beast, these like yeah. boiling, you know, roiling instincts and emotions that have to be contained. And the, the, by the cortex and the, the, it's just, um, it's a fiction. It's a myth. It, it's a myth that you can trace all the way back to stories about morality, um, in ancient Greece. But what you can do is look at the, scientific record and say, well, there, there's other, there are other stories that you could tell about brain evolution and, and the, the context in which brains evolved. So when you look at creatures who don't have brains and you look at creatures who do, what's the difference? And um, you can look at, you know, some animals, um, so we call, scientists call an environment that an animal lives in a niche, their environmental niche. What are the things, what are the parts of the environment that matter to that animal? And um, so there are some animals whose niche hasn't changed in 400 million years. So they're, they're not, these creatures are modern creatures, but they're living in a niche that hasn't changed much. And so their biology hasn't changed much. And you can kind of verify that by looking at the genes that lurk deep, you know, in, in the molecular structure of cells. Mm -hmm. And so you can, by looking at various animals in their developmental state, meaning not, you don't look at adult animals, you look at embryos of animals and developing animals, you can see, you can piece together a different story. And that story is that brains evolved under the selection pressure of hunting. That in the Cambrian period, hunting emerged on the scene where animals deliberately ate one another. Um, and what, so, you know, before the Cambrian period, the animals didn't really have, well, they didn't have brains, but they also didn't have senses, really, the very, very rudimentary senses. So the animal that I wrote about in um, Seven and a Half Lessons is called an amphioxus or a lancelet. Mm -hmm. And um, 
little Amphioxus has no eyes. It has no ears. It has no nose. It 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 has no eyes. It has a couple of cells for um, uh, detecting light and dark for circadian rhythm purposes. So, and it 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 can't hear. It has a vestibular cell to keep its body upright. Um, it has a very rudimentary sense of touch, and it doesn't really have any internal organs other than this, like basically stomach. It's like a mm. just like a. It doesn't. It doesn't have an enteric nervous system. It doesn't have like a gut that, you know, moves mm -hmm. like we do. It just has basically a tube. Yeah. Um. So like it's a like a little container. Like a little container. Yeah. And so, and really, it doesn't. It doesn't move very much. It can move. It just sort of wriggles. It doesn't have very sophisticated movement. And it's this really sweet little <laughs> animal. It yeah. sort of wriggles its way to a spot and then plants itself in the sand and just filters food as the food goes by. Um, and then when the food concentration decreases, it it just it it just um, ejects itself, wriggles to the to some spot randomly where yeah. probabilistically there will be more food and plants itself again. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not really aware very aware that it has an environment. It has yeah. a niche, but that niche is very small and it's not really experiencing that niche yeah. very much. Um, so it's it's basically like a little stomach on a stick. Yeah. That's that's really what it is. And um but but when animals start to literally hunt each other, um all of a sudden it becomes important to have to be able to sense your environment. Because you need to know is that blob up ahead gonna eat me or should I eat it? Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you want distant senses are very useful. And so in the water, distant senses are vision and a little bit hearing, um, olfaction, smelling, and touch. Because in the water, touch is a distant sense because mm -hmm. you can feel the vibration. So it's right. So cool. in... Um, on air, in, on land, you know, vision is a distant sense. Touch, not so much, but for elephants, maybe, right? Um, mm, the vibrations. Vibrations. Um, olfaction, definitely, because of the concentration of, you know, the more concentrated something is, the more likely it is to be close to you. 